I'm Paul Rudy with Paul Rudy's On The Money Radio Show. I have, uh, I guess, my regular guests here. I even have Dr. Fred here today. Dr. Fred Gers joining us. Thanks, yeah, Fred. Yeah, good to be back in the studio again. Yeah, and I have Certified Financial Planner Professionals David Rudy and Ryan Repko. Welcome, guys. Thanks for having us. Good morning. And uh, you can call in with your questions at 217-356-9397 or text us on the Castle Heating and Cooling text line at 351-5357. You can also email your question to talk at WDWS. We also want to welcome those tuning in on Facebook Live. It's important to recognize that past performance is not an indication of future result, results. You should not make any investment decisions without first consulting your own financial advisor and conducting your own research and due diligence. Yeah, I'm a little rusty today. It's been three, week, three weeks. It's <laughs> right. one of those... Uh, where it's not every two weeks, one of those months where the first day of May comes after the first Tuesday. So mm -hmm. it threw me off a little bit, guys. Yeah, normally that comes out silky smooth. I know. I mean, you know, I should get an agent, I think. <laughs> I should. You know, a lot of people. Fred says I should get an agent. He thinks I could make it in the big yeah. time. Well, obviously, uh, you know, we'll get around to talking about all this chaos, especially with you, Dr. Fred. Uh, but before that, news we had a pretty good strong gdp quarter and seemed to take everybody by surprise yeah un unusually strong uh <clears throat> i was saying that uh, we're back in the two percent range for the next uh foreseeable future and all of a sudden it jumped up to a 3.2 percent growth rate which is really very very strong and uh we'd be happy to have that continue for a long time and that'd be more uh in line with normal expectations other than it doesn't normally happen i suppose well I mean, uh normal if you go back 30 40 years i'm going way back <laughs> yeah. just kind of trend but, line uh, the last uh two or three decades we've not uh, met that goal most of the time do you think that foreshadows uh maybe, you know maybe continued strength like that or still are we in this camp of somewhere between two and three percent well i think two and three percent is not a bad uh, right. range to be in uh, the stage of the uh business cycle and given all the uh, issues about uh, uh, workforce participation, things of that sort. So again, uh, I guess the surprise was it wasn't just a few months before that everybody was talking, it was obsessed by the word recession. Right. So that sort of receded now. And, uh, and uh, so it, it, go, it comes and goes, but there's uh, obviously always a threat of recession, but nothing immediate. And most, uh, there was a, a survey of economists, they thought wage growth would be uh, strong this year. Yeah, it looks like it, you know, looks like that. It looks like things are accelerating to me as opposed to decelerating. And it acceleration be, has to be on the side of uh, wage growth because there can't be much acceleration in terms of uh, a lower unemployment rate. Well, uh, right, because we're pretty much, you know, we used to be, you know, you think if we were here, uh, it would be inflationary maybe because of labor costs because yeah. you can only, seems like everybody who wants a job has one within you know right a degree of reason yeah not not the job they want but the right. job they could have yeah I mean, it's certainly it's it would seem to me that um if people vote their and i'm not going down the political road here but it seems like if i'm running for re-election for president i'm liking what i'm seeing as far as is that you know wasn't there an old saying people vote their pocketbook or their checkbook yeah it's a very strong uh uh part of people's uh, voting decision, but uh, people are particularly polarized now, so I, I'm not sure everyone's going to uh, vote for their, their uh, checkbook this time. Right, uh, you just can't take it for granted, but it, it, would, it would seem that it, it's hard to uh, sing a song that we're doing poorly. Right. The other thing that uh, 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 President Trump is playing a kind of dangerous game when he talks about people's 401ks, because right. uh, as we know that, in, in a, in a a uh, few weeks that could change very dramatically. Yeah, that's for sure. And now that kind of leads us to, of course, yesterday's excitement in the stock market, which, you know, you know, guys, uh, for you younger guys, you know, thank God every day that that if the stock market falls one or two percent, that hmm. people be just come beside them, besides themselves. And uh, uh, it, it is something about this human condition that just doesn't allow people to recognize that. Yeah, this is what happens. You know, kind of goes up and down along this permanent uptrend. Mm -hmm. It's really that simple, but suddenly people get obsessed with whatever that apocalypse du jour is. Yeah. And so how worried should we be? Well, I'm not so much worried about the stock market. And I I guess I, I assume that eventually rationality will prevail. But uh, I'd have to use a tennis term, an unforced error here. That, uh, the uh, 
idea of, of fighting a trade war with China really is is silly, and and the goal they have of selling more in China really is uh, not going to happen. We don't have balanced trade with China. China sells a lot to us. It's about four to one, isn't right? It? Somewhere, and, in that. and there's no way that we're going to uh, have a, a major expansion of our sales in China. So the and uh, there are all kinds of evidences of this uh, in terms of agricultural exports and things that are sort of being hurt. So what we're doing is is uh, helping the the weak industries at the expense of our productive ones. For example, there was a, a study that showed that um, maybe, uh, I'm sure not correct to the, the last dollar, but every job in the steel industry cost about a million dollars a year in terms of losses in other parts of the economy. So is this this Milton Friedman idea that we should uh, not fight the fact that other countries want to sell us their goods below cost? Right. And it's not, I mean, it's not just Milton Friedman, it's David Ricardo and Adam well, Smith. Well, yeah, I understand. Because, so, I mean, uh, the, the people people forget that trade is not a, a negative sum game. One, one side doesn't win and the other side loses. Both sides uh, gain. If they don't gain, they don't participate. Is there anything to this? Uh, some people can dismiss it real quickly. And uh, I'm just going to admit, I don't, I've done quite a bit of reading on it, but this issue, particularly lately, and you know, yeah, it just makes me wonder. I guess I have a little bit of paranoia that China is our next biggest enemy and they do want to steal a lot right. of our stuff. And, and, and they, and I think they probably have, but I don't have any facts to back. Well, that. that's just a that, feeling. Is there anything to that? Is there a reason to be, is there any reason at all to be firm on this? Well, it's to be firm, I think in terms of intellectual property and, uh, stealing of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, um, techniques and things of that sort, but that's not really fought on the tariff front. It has to be fought in other ways. So putting a tariff on uh, uh, Chinese goods has very little to do with the intellectual property side of things. And it seems like really weird math to say that so, you know, these people are going to pay the tariff. I mean, yeah. everything I understood from, a, a, I had so many economic classes that I was one or two away from a, a, a major or maybe as a minor in economics. And, uh, and it just strikes me that uh, this <laughs> that this tr this trade thing is just getting out that it's yeah. a tax on it essentially ultimately becomes a tax right. on consumers. Well, the, the ultimate goal, I suppose, uh, the, the Trump people would say is to uh, uh, get China to agree and then go back to a more favorable kind of situation. So that may be possible. So we've had this kind of ebb and flow where people get really worried and then things kind sure. of recede. So this is the. Uh, peak in terms of people being worried. So I suspect that over the next uh, several weeks, there'll be some kind of uh, backing off. And Is there anything to this idea that, hey, they sell four times as much to us as them, and they have like seven or 800 million people that they kind of right. have to keep away from the gates at any one time, uh, that maybe we hold the, the higher cards here if, if we play the long game? I mean, that well, they, they can't really take the China can't take the risk uh, just on relative size, yeah. size basis. No, that's true. But uh, I guess the question is, what are we trying to win? Right. And I'm not, it's not clear. Yeah. I mean, uh, everyone has a trade imbalance with sure. other people. I, I have a trade imbalance with uh, Schnucks grocery store. I spend a lot more at <laughs> Schnucks than they, they spend with me. Right. And so every kind of trade is not necessarily balanced where, uh, one side spends exactly the same as the other side, and that's true of, of countries as well. Like, I think people get caught up in surpluses and deficits because right. one person's surplus is another person's deficit, and it all, you know, when you when you do the accounting, it all adds up. And the uh, the balancing factor is the fact that uh, foreigners, and especially Chinese, are willing to invest a lot in the U.S. economy, and that's not insignificant. Well, I guess this too shall pass is my guess that uh, there's a lot of posturing going on, but of course it rattles people in the short run. And it's just amazing to, to watch these high frequency traders and these knuckleheads that, you know, suddenly change in investors. But th th that's where the danger comes in, guys, is when investors misread these things and they see these things and they feel like they need to react as opposed to acting on a plan at all times. Well, and don't you think that's happening already? I mean, I, I think we've had I overheard you with a client yesterday kind of asking about it. I had a family member ask me about how these tariffs are going to affect right. the stock market. And I think the natural reaction is, well, it can't be good. So I better do something and I right. better get out. And, it's, you know, you have to always tell people like, 
look, it's basically impossible to predict in the short run exactly how things will play out. Basically, when what I tell people is, you know, when news comes out that's negative or potentially negative for the stock market, it tends to get priced in super, super fast to the point where it's too late to do anything about it by the time you even know about it. Yeah, and that isn't that the point? Uh, and you guys have heard me say this in those, I'll say, well, I don't know what's going to cause the next market decline, but uh, somebody will tell us what it is after the fact. But the point is, um, we have this permanent uptrend in historical and stock prices. Now, we may not know what that slope of that trend line is going to be, how steep it's going to be, but it's probably going to continue on its way up. But the capital markets, the stock markets, they they tend to outrun themselves on the way up and on the way down. And people want to always pontificate about this nice, eloquent reason why it did this today or this month or this year. But in reality, that's just a part of the process. If people want to earn the premium returns of the ownership of equity has provided historically, though we don't know what it will be in the future, uh, that you know the price for that is the unpredictability in the near term. And so we can just almost stop there. I mean, it's kind of like when Dr. Fred comes up with something that seems simple, and it is about explaining trade imbalance with Schnucks. I mean, that's where you go, yeah, now I get it. Okay. Uh, that, that maybe I shouldn't be as afraid of these things as I should be, but it's amazing how it has an impact on the American uh, investor right. psyche, not just the American, the, the world, I suppose. And also it shows that, uh, uh, there's some games you're, you're better not playing. I, I think that Paul Jr. wrote about the idea of not investing in uh, uh, marijuana stock because it uh, is uncertain, but the, he could have said almost any stock. Uh, it's not just you don't want to invest in, in that particular industry. It be Bitcoin, you, you don't, you don't want to be. choose any particular uh, uh, option and, and go all the way that way. It's basically a matter of, uh, of uh, spreading yourself uh, over the whole spectrum and, and lowering costs. And that's, that's but, about it. You know, I've had a number of clients that suddenly want to, well, they want all in on cannabis stocks, you know, as if like we're missing something. Uh, and, and, and people can go to RudyWealth.com and read Paul's blog on that, uh, Paul Jr.'s blog on cannabis stocks. But it's kind of these things sometimes come out and they look so obvious that we're all going to yeah. just get rich on them. And, and I just roll my eyes. But he could say that and, <laughs> in the future, oh, and fill in the blank and just go back and say, well, we're going to rewrite the article. I just have to change one word. Uh, you know, it's X, Y, Z type of stocks. It's what do you think of this idea, guys? Because we had a, a prospective client that mentioned Rick Edelman, who has Edelman Financial, Financial Engines, uh, one of the largest investment advisors in the country, uh, kind of a national radio show, et cetera. And he's a pretty, pretty clever guy. And I, I find myself agreeing to very a lot of what he says i listen to him occasionally but one of the things and, and is this any different this so the, the guy hit me he said well what about disruptive technologies what are you guys doing about that i go yeah. well we're trying not to be a victim of them uh <laughs> disruptive technologies he says well, well rick edelman says that you need to be in these disruptive technologies and i said well our clients are in them they're just not in them in any concentrated fashion but it gets circles back david and ryan to well, we know there's going to be a lot of disruption and there's going to be technologies that drive much of it. And therefore, we have to be positioned for it. I mean, what, what would you even do? Right. Well, and, and like you said, it's not necessarily a matter of do you own them? It's do you overweight them relative to just like the natural market? Because if you follow our advice and you basically are globally diversified, like you said, you're going to own them but you're not carving out like a big piece of your portfolio. And I, I think a lot of it gets down to why do you believe that those are going to have a higher expected return than any other stock? And there's, or the, or there's zero research to show that uh, the stock of companies that make disruptive technologies, I don't even know exactly what would fall within that. I mean, I have some ideas, but it's like there's no research that suggests those particular types of companies would have higher expected returns. So it's really a matter of, do you think they're mispriced? And that's really what, what you have to believe is that they're priced too low relative to basically their future earnings and profits. Yeah. And, and, and there's no one stock that says disruptive technology. For example, right. if you go back 110 years, uh, the automobile was extremely disruptive. So if you go back to 1910, uh, should we invest in automobiles? Probably, but there are a hundred different automobile companies. Only two or three of those actually 
uh, made it. Yeah. So uh, you choose Ford, maybe you're you're if it's um, publicly traded, you're in good shape. But nine nine other companies probably are Gone. going nowhere. Yeah, so many companies produce disruptive technologies. GE, a, a blue chip stock, they're constantly producing new machines and new technology that changes our world. But like, you know, how do you dif differentiate one from the other? You can. So like David's saying, you don't place everything in one basket. I think so many times people get caught up in the the moonshot idea of, oh, if I got on got in on this early, or if only I had got in on this 20 years ago, it's like you looking back saying, gosh, I wish I would have done it. And now they're at this point today at time zero. Now's my chance to get in on something before it's too late. And it's let's let's ride this one up. So uh, on that note, I actually have a very, I don't know if the word would be skeptical or kind of negative viewpoint on a lot of this stuff. But I think the reason that people are always looking for this big win is to get out of the reality of the fact that they have to live frugally and save money and invest in a, a patient manner for many years. They want the quick win so that they don't have to go through the, you can call it pain or sacrifice, that really is what required to have a high likelihood of success. And I think that happens in almost every industry. I think it's why people look for miracle supplements that help them <laughs> lose weight and stuff like that. People want all the reward without the sacrifices that are required to achieve whatever they want to achieve. It, it's the lottery dream. Exactly. It's the odds are so stacked against you and you know what going into it, but if I do hit it, I'm going to be set. So here's another interesting thing. Speaking of the lottery, I, have to I know teeing you up. I, I know this is a little bit <laughs> of a, a, a tangent, but very interesting phenomenon in stock prices or stock returns is that t uh, investments that have a quote, lottery-like distribution tend to have lower average returns than just the stock market as a whole. And what I mean by a lottery-like distribution is you have a, a high likelihood of basically losing all your money or losing most of your money, but you have a very small likelihood of an astronomical payoff. And so things that fall into that category would be like uh, penny stocks, stocks that are kind of in bankruptcy, uh, extremely small growth companies with very little earnings or um, recent IPOs, initial public offerings. And all of those things are, are, there's research showing that they're these anomalies in stock returns that they actually have worse returns than the, just the market overall. And the, the explanation for it that they come up with is that people are really attracted to investments that kind of behave like a lottery ticket. They, mm -hmm. They're okay with you know, a high likelihood of losing a small amount of money if it gives them that chance, that small chance of a huge payoff. So they pay too much for them, basically. Yeah, you get the worst of both worlds, a high, yeah. high variability and low return. Exactly. Well, I, you know, maybe I'm too cynical and tell me if I am, but I still, I think Wall Street is really good at recognizing this human condition and this human nature of that lottery effect. And so they're always trying to pander to emotion and saying, hey, disruptive technologies, let's pump this as the next idea. And maybe it's even a financial advisor can do that to try to different, differentiate himself from other firms like, oh, well, we're into this disruptive technology. And if you miss it, it's going to be at your peril. I look at those things more as marketing pitches. Like, as you said, there's no evidence uh, uh, at all that suggests that A, you might be right about disruptive technologies and B, if you are right, even in general terms, uh, that you're going to find a way to effectively or consistently or reliably make money from it. Well, that's the thing. You have to ask yourself, what do I know that the market in aggregate doesn't know? And the, I mean, that's the key. And I think people miss out on it is even if you're right about the direction of a certain industry or a certain company. And so take marijuana stocks. Even if you're right that the marijuana companies as kind of an industry or a group end up becoming, you know, hugely profitable and have, you know, a huge, a huge amount of revenue in the future. That's not enough to tell you that it's a good investment with strong returns, because if everyone already expects that, then the price is already bid up to reflect that information and the expected return going forward is not any higher. And in fact, you can have a, a company or an industry where it does have really good returns and it has subpar performance because it got bid up too high. And that, I mean, that happens all the time. And people just forget about that. They yeah, think uh, that. An example is uh, uh, Neiman Marcus is probably one of the premier uh, 
department stores in the world and still as good as ever, but they're close to bankruptcy because someone paid too much for them. Right. And exactly. it, this all gets back. And Fred, I think you just gave the best example. Uh, there, you know, there's been a few transformative industries. Railroad was one of the earlier ones. Uh, then, uh, you know, automobile, uh, air, air transportation, all of those were major uh, transitional shifts to an economy. And they did more than everybody thought they would do. It's just that most people, particularly when we talk about the public, when the public gets involved, public money, public investors, uh, you can be dead right. We saw it even uh, in the internet uh, craze, the dot-com era, as it's referred to in the late nine, mid to late 90s. Everything that everybody thought the internet would do, uh, actually, they undershot it by a long, but, but yet most people went broke chasing that dream. So... I just want to, I wanted to bring that up because I guess that's just the the newest theme, disruptive technology that probably is going to be take place, is taking place. But as you said, it always circles back to, well, I really can't figure out a way, nor could anybody else, how to take advantage of that with any reliable fashion. So now I'm back to the basic issue of I'm either lending my money to people that want capital or I'm going to buy partial ownership in their venture companies. And so I'm going to be a lender or an owner and lenders get paid a lot less money. So even when we're talking about certificates of deposit, we're lending our money to that bank. And even when CDs were 5%, you could lop off 1% for taxation and another 3% for trend line inflation. And you got maybe a 1% real after tax return. And compared to the partial ownership, at least historically speaking, uh, the after tax, after inflation return is five, six, seven times higher than that. Well, and there's a there's a one word explanation for it: unpredictability. Um, when you instead of when you lend your money to a bank and buy a CD, you're certain that you're going to get that money back. There's there's why would there be much reward for certain a certain event versus if I buy shares in that bank, uh, I really don't know what my return over the next year is going to be. Maybe it's going to be 20 or 30% to the good or 20 or 30% to the bad. Bonds don't act like that. So it's that unpredictability of returns. <clears throat> and about the only way you can make sense out of it is to back up, understand that that's the deal, and give it a few decades to let itself hopefully work out. And the reason I say hopefully, because we could look at, 100, 150 years, 200 years of stock returns, and we still can't make too strong of a case for the future exactly what's going to happen. That's our way of saying past performance is no indication of future results, but it does give you a, a historical concept of the risk and reward structure between being a lender versus an owner of companies. So as Forrest Gump said, that's all I got to say about that. <laughs> uh, we, I saw that, uh, it, well, I guess this kind of almost fits into that hyper theme, right? Yep. Uber and Lyft. Uh, here's two companies bleeding money. They're not, there are no earnings, bleeding money, okay? And I think Uber sold off a small piece of the company in an IPO for about $8 billion. Now those investors are already underwater. It's probably sorry that they did that. But if they're a lot lifetime holders, maybe it'll work out for them. Same thing with Lyft. It's really, <clears throat> it's this obvious, look how, I mean, I, we all, Fred, I you use Uber sometimes, yeah. yeah. So there aren't many people that don't, if they use Uber at all, and I just never have used Lyft, so I just, I'm gonna say it's probably the same, you know, type of deal. Uh, I find it incredibly convenient and worthwhile, and I think it is exciting, and I think it's doing everything, and it's got a lot of good for society. But here's a company that hasn't figured out how to make money yet. I, mean, I don't know how you price something like that. Right. And I know one thing too that when you're when you're new in a field or you're you're kind of breaking away from the mainstay, it's the Facebook model. It's like their whole goal was not to make money. They were a loss leading company for a reason. They were trying to get users. So year after year after year, intentionally not trying to to bring a profit in because they wanted to get the lion's share of social media. I don't think that's all that different from what Uber's strategy has been either, was to try to be the premier largest provider of 
ride hailing services. And now they say that they're a, a connection company. They, they are not a, a, a cab company. They try to bring people or things together. I think that could be a very big part of their strategy. And so much of that is timing is you have to let the time go by to build the base to then have that infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you can build up the revenues and the right. profits. And that clearly is the case. That is their business <laughs> yeah. model, uh, you know, capture market share, uh, be the dominant brand, all those things. Netflix did that. Uh, there's a lot of companies that have been very successful that are raking in lots of cash later down the years. I'm just saying it's just, it's just interesting how, yeah. You know, things that look so obvious, we think we're going to capture these extraordinary right. But there, there's really no place to hide. Uh, the, the other extreme, I just went to a, a meeting and someone came in and said, uh, Costco is a great company. They pay a $15 right. wage. They keep their aisles clean. Uh, uh, people like them and so on, which is all probably true. But is that a good investment? Well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe all that information has been already uh, incorporated in people's uh idea about Costco and maybe the price reflects that. So th there's no secret formula here. And that's such an important lesson that I think most people who aren't investment experts just don't understand is that it's not just because a company is a good company or a profitable company does not automatically mean it's a good investment. It depends what price you pay for that investment. And that just drives everything and people forget that. And so they look at the obvious and they say, well, look how many you know people are using Uber and look how, how just prevalent it is throughout the world or look at how profitable this company is. And they forget the fact that, well, the price might already be high enough to basically account for that good information. So, I mean, again, it depends what you pay for it. And everybody knows that, you know, Google is a growth company and, you know, it has so they can charge, you know, they could pay a lot less for capital because they're a safer bet to investors. And I think that's counterintuitive to people that companies that are actually not excellent companies have to pay more money for capital. And it's really what you're paying for a dollar of those earnings and it's the growth rate. And is this kind of Fred uh, all get back to fatal conceit? I mean, at the end of the day, isn't it a lot of this like, I sure. know so much more about this than the oh, than seven or eight billion overlapping minds on the planet. Right, and there's no. We're not saying uh, don't buy Costco or don't buy oh, sure. uh, uh, the other. Right. Let's the be clear is, on that. Uh, you want to buy a little bit of everything and uh, and not uh, not try to make the guesses because you're probably uh, you're not necessarily going to be wrong. But the cost of doing that, especially if you do it through a, a institutional arrangement, is going to be more then you'll get back in terms of extra return. Okay, I'm going to go next to a boring subject, but it's fascinating to me. And it's kind of antithetical to trying to hit the lottery win when it comes to investing. You're listening to Paul Rudy's On The Money on WDWS.com. I'm here with Dr. Fred Gertz and certified financial planner professionals, David Rudy and Ryan Repco. Um, so dividends. Um, companies, so I'm going to... Uh, kind of narrow this down to the 500 largest companies in the U.S. So the guys know I'm kind of a, I love to create programs and mess around with data and do historical real deep dives on issues. And so I decided to, I've done a lot of reading about dividends and I've always felt like, yeah, that's an important part of total return and investing process. If you're going to be a partial owner of companies, historically dividends paid an important role, but I didn't really have a good enough sense of proportionality. Just, just, how important <clears throat> those might be, and what I might expect uh, when I look back historically. So I'm gonna throw a couple numbers. So what I did is I sliced and diced every 10 year period holding of the Standard & Poor's 500 index. I used the case, the, Dr. Uh, Schiller's data on the S&P 500, created a program that allowed me to do this pretty quickly. And I wanted to know a couple things, and, and, and I really this, the, the, the reason I, that I even clicked with me is I read a, an article about just the last 10 years, I saw that the, the dividends on the Standard & Poor's 500 index, which is basically the ownership of the 500 largest companies in America, have gone up somewhere around 90% just in the last 10 years, and the cost of living has gone up 20. And I wondered, is that an outlier? Is that typical? Is it highly unusual? You know, is it? And so I sliced and diced it to death. And here's what I found out. So when I just look at all the 10-year periods, and this is since 1940, I think it's 822 10-year periods if you're using monthly data. Half the time, 
your you would have seen your dividend increase from your initial investment 75 percent uh, that to me maybe it, some people might yawn at that i'm thinking wait a minute if i'm in retirement and my goal is to not only preserve but maybe enhance my standard of living or at a minimum as i said uh if my cost over a two to three decade retirement are at least going to double and likely triple i need an income that rises as well well that's a pretty powerful statement right there saying that half of 10-year periods dividend increased 75 percent now in real terms that's about half that or a little less 35 percent but that's real after tax inflation adjusted i'm staying ahead of my cost of living and uh the other thing I, and this is an aside 25 percent of the time you would see your dividends raised by 50 percent or more again past is no indication of future results i'm talking about the past here but when you think about what our demand in retirement is rising incomes i think sometimes that solution ownership of the main street companies <clears throat> uh, mainstream equities uh, may be a significant part and an underappreciated part of the retirement income stream puzzle. The other thing I wanted to know, and actually I, I did this one first, I wanted to know how long it typically takes for my dividend income stream to double. And so I looked at the same period, 1940 to present. Half the time, if I want to see my dividends, if I'm wondering how long it takes for them to double, it's median uh, number of years it takes 12.3 well you think about it that's not so bad uh and and 75 percent uh 25 percent of the time it only took about nine years and 75 percent of the time it took about 14 years so historically speaking if you looked at a 30-year retirement 75 percent of the time you would have seen your income stream from dividends double halfway within that 30-year period uh <laughs> Why? Why are why are C, why is CNBC and these things not obsessing about kind of obvious issues of saying, look, you don't have to win the lottery to succeed, particularly in retirement. First of all, you need to accumulate these great companies of the world, and you're going to have a balanced portfolio. This is not a suggestion anybody or everybody should be a hundred percent of their portfolio and ownership of the great companies of America and the world, but it. It, when I think about stock market timers and trend followers, you know, one of the things they may be missing out on is this a very important dividend stream. What's your take on that? Is that a part of your, in your personal portfolio? I'm not asking anything about it, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's, I'm going to guess it's not all bonds, but maybe it yeah. is. But do you ever think of it in terms, Fred, of that dividend, the importance of that dividend income? Or is it? Well, I guess uh, maybe uh, break the train of thought, but the answer is no. Uh, most of my funds are in uh, qualified plans, that, and so I don't distinguish between uh, capital gains and dividends. The only time I deal with dividends is tax season at the end of the year when yeah. they uh, when the uh, uh, dividends have to be uh, taxed. So uh, again, I think people dividends are, are a, a signal or a sign of how com companies are doing. And but whether it comes out in dividends or comes out in capital gains, I think it's not not particularly important. So there's a, a puzzle that economists ask, and that is uh, why pay dividends at all? Uh, there are advantages of, of capital gains over dividends. And why not just keep it in? And and one answer is it's a signal of how healthy the company is. You can't really fake dividends over a long period of time. So it's a, it's a real substantial uh, kind of uh, signal. But uh, since I don't invest in individual stocks, I really don't look at uh, dividends separately. And in the end, total return is the only return that's important. I just, I just think, I just found it really interesting yeah. just to see that historical trend of yeah. that powerful part of invest part, a very powerful part of total return is dividend yeah. income. Now, and again, if you're a value investor, that's probably uh, very important. I, I've, I've seen presentations of managers who say the only thing we look at it is dividends and, and we capitalize that and, and then we base our our uh, uh, stock selection on that and they've obviously done very poorly the last uh, 10 years or so because value has has been out of its favor compared to uh, growth and Dave there's a school of thought that I'm really kind of describing uh, that safety security first or safety first and that and that it somewhat centers around that is lock up as much of your really necessary income to get by and 
income streams that are guaranteed and then the rest would get invested in the stock market and you might live off just the dividends or the dividends and in a good year you take capital gains. Right. And we've talked about that approach before on the show and it's just a different approach with different pros and cons. It, it kind of reduces the downside and reduces the upside in terms of potential spending. You know, I, I you've talked to me about this a lot the last couple of weeks and the thing that I always talk about is, you know, I, I think my concern even t talking or focusing on dividends on the show is that people are going to take this and be like, oh, I should invest primarily in dividend paying stocks or exclude stocks that don't pay dividends. And that's really not a great idea either. It's more just kind of an interesting thing to look at that, look, these dividends tend to increase fairly substantially over time. And, and like you said, if you're needing to generate an income from retirement, it just shows how much just even without creating capital gains to supplement that income, how much your income could go up. But realistically, you can sell pieces of your portfolio and basically create income out of the capital gains or just the growth of your portfolio. You don't necessarily have to differentiate. It's just one other path. Um, so how about this? Uh, I have money to put away for 10 years. I can buy a 10-year U.S. Treasury and get paid 2.4% last time I looked for every year for the next two. So I'm guaranteed to not earn more. I'm guaranteed to not earn less, 2.4%. Or I can own the 500 largest companies in America. And now when I look back at historical data, I'm saying, well, gosh, uh, not only is the income stream not that far away from a 10-year U.S. Treasury, okay, it might be 2% versus 2.4%, but Half the time, I will see my dividend, historically speaking, rise 75%. And I also get a call option on any potential appreciation, which over most 10-year periods can be rather handsome. Though it's never a lock, is it? And David's smiling, Fred. <laughs> so here's the key difference. I'm, I always know I'm in trouble <laughs> when I say something and Dave's over there kind of smirking or smiling. For someone, it's such a different type of investment. So I completely agree with you from like, if you just look at the interest versus the dividend income, it kind of, you're like, why would anyone ever buy this 10 year US treasury? But the difference is with a 100% stock portfolio, you could see that cut in half over the next year with a treasury bond or treasury bill, you're not gonna see, that. see much fluctuation in your, get the principal value of your initial investment. So it is unpredictability. So yeah, exactly. And, and whether it's dividends or capital gains, it's like, yeah, you have a lot more upside, not just in growing your wealth, but in your spending, which they kind of go hand in hand because the more wealth you have, the more you're going to be able to spend from it. Um, you know, that it's basically just a, a risk and return story. And then if you basically don't want to put up with that fluctuation, you know, you don't have any upside in the principal. It's like, yeah, you're gonna not be able to spend as much. It's just and there's a chance ten years from now, my uh, ten thousand dollars I invested in the S and P five hundred is worth uh, thirty thousand. Exactly. I mean, uh, three thousand yeah. is what I wanted yeah, to say. Right. That's the risk side. If it goes up to thirty, yeah. we're we're all happy. But I think it comes out to the. I was saying there's no free lunch. I mean, you could say, well, why not? Instead of buying bonds, why not buy high dividend stock? Well, high dividend stocks is kind of a halfway point between. Uh, traditional equity and bonds, but it has some of the advantages and some of the disadvantages of both, but there's no way to have everything. There's no way to have the a higher return of uh, of stocks and the uh, lower risk of bonds. It, right. Yeah, so we and, shouldn't think of it as a binary one or the other, should we? No, definitely not. And and very few of our clients are 100% stock or 100% bond. I can't think of any that, well, young people that are 100% hey, stock, we but have, retired. We have some... 80 <laughs> mid 80 year olds that are 100 percent stock and yeah. have been for years but so that's those are the outliers. key is to be able to implement that strategy and kind of what you're even describing is like you have to be able to ignore a 50 plus percent decline i know i'm going to the extreme but it's like well, well those, they those happen. happen occasionally if you can do that yeah then that's great be 100 percent stock spend your dividends or take a conservative withdrawal rate, you kind of end up in the same place. So how do you know? Which, where do you, uh, when you're turning that dial, where, how do you know where to stop it between stocks and bonds? Well, that's where you just have to basically develop a retirement plan that shows kind of the, the I just impact wanted to see, I just wanted spending. to see if he was paying attention. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think sometimes, well, not sometimes, it's always important to then consider what's the money for and when is it needed. So if you're just saying that, 
you know, we're just investing $10,000 and we're not taking into account the purpose of the money. And your whole goal is, I want to see if I can maximize price appreciation or the amount of assets I might have at the end. Sure, the, the concept of being in stock positions is, is favorable for, to do that. But if you need that money for your expenses and your living and you need to maybe fund a particular goal at the end of 10 years, then it's not reasonable or responsible to put it in a fixed or 100% equity portfolio or high tilt towards equity. So if it's a three three decade retirement, then aren't bonds irrational? Not necessarily. It's just a deliberate decision to basically build a portfolio with a lower expected return so that you don't have to sit through as large of declines during those three decades because very few people yeah. want to see their money or their investment portfolio get cut by a third regularly and probably a half at least once during that time frame. It's just like a psychological preference because at a certain point too, it's like, you know, we have a lot of clients where they say, well, I'm doing everything I want to do. Additional money really won't buy me extra happiness or, or bring me a lot of utility, but seeing it cut in half sure <laughs> sure would really distress me. So it, it's kind of a trade off and you do get, it's like the marginal utility of increased wealth. So in other words, it, it's not rational to risk what you have and need for what you don't have and don't need. Exactly. So in other words, uh, I don't need a re expected return outcome of a hundred percent stock portfolio. I can have a balanced portfolio and go to heaven having done everything <laughs> I wanted to do on earth. Uh, so then it becomes rational. Yeah. But you're 80 year old with 100% equity. Uh, they, that family probably has so much that they could take a 50% hit and correct. still have pl plenty to correct. Live on. Right. You yeah. are correct on that one. And the people that I can, the clients I can think of who are in that boat or close to it, you know, a really high stock allocation, I think almost all of them have big pension income. Well, you can kind of count that like fixed in and covering all your expenses. Well, who cares what's happening with your portfolio in the short That's run? That's why Fred's always You're, happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it really is. I mean, the, if you have yeah. a lot of guaranteed income streams, yeah, be 100% stock because those guaranteed income streams are kind of serving the purpose that the bond portfolio would so serve anyways. So my next question is, if we know, <clears throat> you just said it, every five years or so, um, one should expect their stock portion of their portfolio to decline, oh, 20 to... 35%. That would be pretty typical. And so why is it, since we know that, and that's gone on since almost the beginning of time, Fred and Dave, and how could people still get caught by surprise? I don't think people know it. That's. I think you're assuming people know it. I think as an advisor, you, you know. <clears throat> Do you think would it's you because we talk in terms of percentages and not dollars? Or I, I don't know it's that they get caught by surprise. It's just that they still get st stressed <laughs> out about it too. I mean, some of them, yeah, get surprised. But or surprised by the specific event or the timing, I think a lot of it is just no matter what, no one's going to like seeing their their portfolio decline substantially, and they're always going to be tempted to figure out a way to avoid that pain, but still have the returns. <clears throat> I think it's just it sounds so great, and if you could successfully time the market, it would be amazing. You could get the returns of the stock market without having to go through the the decline. Well, yeah, that would be amazing. You'd end up with billions of dollars, millions of dollars. And One of the things that's interesting when it comes to this human nature is like you could follow a sensible uh, trend following system, which is basically a, a market timing system. Okay. Bigger picture, not trading in and out every day and historically have done very well. The problem is they are wrong a lot in the short run and they'll chip at your money and chip at your money and chew you up a little bit. And then, all of a sudden people convince themselves it's not, it's no longer working. They get, they quit using that maybe a perfectly good trend following system. And then it reasserts itself to a trend and then they miss out. So even, even sometimes when you could have a reasonable uh, trend following system, it still doesn't work because of the human component. Yeah. People, uh, I, I think even uh, all of us probably, uh, <laughs> think about it when the market goes down. I mean, I, I can't help it. Just because uh, my work. fees go down, Fred. Yeah, it's all right. about me. Right. But you, you think about, well, we're up to 25,000 now in the Dow. That's fine. And but, but so it goes down a little bit. But if it went down to, uh, you know, 40%, I'd be uh, uh, Probably for lots. About, but would I that mean, be for just that reason or lots of reasons? Well, just because I, I, I think you think about your high water mark and sure. compared to the. 
but you, you have to get over that. So my 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 thinking shifts from uh, setting a a high water mark to setting a low water mark. Say, well, it's just not going down this low. And this is really, really what we're describing is a very uh, psychological, emotional aspect when it comes to investing. And that's why I've said so many times and people give me a strange look when I say, it turns out investment returns don't matter. It's investor behavior. It's how they behave over those critical periods, uh, particularly when you get into these secular bull markets and the mid part of your life, when you actually have some money to put at it. And then they kind of miss that. Just it, it's, it's, this, I don't know, you two young guys, you've been in this business now for four or five years. Uh, am I missing anything that it's almost all the problems when it comes to investing are psychological? I mean, the the big problems, because those are the things that totally derail uh, a financial plan or even just a, a financial livelihood. It's, it's behavior. Whether you have a subtly different investment philosophy, if you use actively managed funds, I'm not a fan of that, but you're going to be fine over your lifetime. That type of stuff doesn't matter too much. I mean, it makes a difference, right. but it's not going to totally destroy you. Right. Selling out when the market's down a bunch is going to destroy you. Chasing um, a hot stock or industry, putting all your money in an individual company, being really concentrated. Those are things that destroy financial life. Or uh, when you're 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, investing most of your 401k in bonds. Uh, going to have a significant impact on the outcome of your retirement. Uh, and, and I don't think... The industry spends as much time talking about the things that really count and really matter, what you can control versus what you can't control. Well, we can control our costs. We can control our asset allocation. Those are big ones, especially asset allocation. I mean, cost, obviously, too, but asset allocation is one of the biggest levers that we have control over and behavior. But we have our, all the control over that lever. It's just that a lot of us can't touch the lever. And uh, Yeah, it's one thing to feel bad. It's another thing to take action. So uh, if you avoid taking action, that's the uh, main thing. Isn't the essence of having a financial plan, guys, that you're operating from, is the, is the essence of that is so that you're acting and never reacting? Is that, is that kind of the beauty of it? Certainly. I, I think it's like writing a letter to yourself in the future, and I think I've mentioned that before. It's like we know at some point in the future our, our high water mark, as Dr. Fred said, is going to be quite a bit lower. We know it's going to happen. It's inevitable. We want to remind ourselves that during that time when it shows up, that there is a purpose for the money and that the allocation, whether it's 60% stocks, 40% bonds or whatever it may be, is there for a reason. And we're not simply just going to react to temporary market conditions. We have a plan in place because we're trying to drive a 20, 30 year retirement without having to go back to work. Why do you think people, half the people do not, at least the studies I've seen, I can't cite them right now to be fair, but it, my takeaway is half the people do not have in retirement, do not have a retirement financial plan. Uh, and, and do you think there's any one powerful reason for that? I think it's just something that's easy to put off. They don't know how to go about doing it. And so you just don't do it. It's one of those things that you're going to get to at some point. I bet there's similar statistics with people who don't have wills in basic estate right. planning documents. Like, I think everyone, more, even more than a retirement plan, understand that those things are important, but they, they still don't do it. There's a lot of things in life where... Would you say half the you people know, that walk in are, as a new client or potential client uh, either don't have a will or a trust in the things in the doc, uh, the healthcare power of attorneys, uh, financial power of attorneys, uh, at least half of them either don't have them or they're outdated? Oh, yeah. It's, it's a high percentage. And think we probably get people who tend to be a little more planning thoughtful, oriented and yeah. thoughtful about that stuff. So it's probably even worse as the population overall. But I think just that there's, like I said, a lot of things in life where people know that certain things are important and things that they should be doing, but they don't do it out of, you could call it laziness or just yeah. inertia. Yeah, college, if you ask most parents, do you want your kids to go to college? The answer is yes. If you ask them how much you save for college, it's not the, not the same. Yeah, the All skin right. in the game always tells you the reality. Well, it all circles back. To, am I wrong when I say so frequently in my newsletter and sometimes on the show that human nature is a failed investor? Yeah, I think so. I think 
the typical person tends to make really poor investment decisions one way or the other. What's it's the either, best, then either what's the panicking solution? or chasing something, hoping for that big win. And the answer to that problem is what? Uh, education, educating yourself or having hire, a plan. or hiring someone That's, to help you. Yeah. <laughs> like hire an advisor to, to give you the advice when you're about to panic and make that sell. Having someone who's in your corner. Don't you think, uh, if, for, if nothing else, just having an advisor that you can bounce things off of that may not be as emotional as you. And I even keep thinking, think of how many clients we have uh, or one spouse really initiates a relationship with okay. us really more to protect the other spouse who isn't as aware of financial issues. Um, and they have that real concern and they, they recognize that I got to get in front of this. I better establish a relationship with somebody who isn't going to take advantage of my spouse. Uh, you know, we're seeing more and more of that each day. Uh, I get a number of clients coming in just saying, I could tell the one spouse isn't all that excited about hiring a financial advisor because he or she want, they want to do it themselves, but they know the reality as we get older, uh, our cognitive decline uh, kicks in and we better have that relationship in place. Otherwise, uh, the other spouse who may not be as knowledgeable and aware of issues can easily be taken care of particularly at a stressful time like spouse, uh, death of a spouse. Well, guys, that's about it. I thought this was a pretty good round table today. We didn't even have a script, really. And uh, David was boring as usual. But, you know, <laughs> we're trying to overlook that, Fred. Uh, anyway, uh, we will be back in a couple of weeks uh, with Paul Rudy's On the Money. Thank you, Dr. Fred Gertz and certified uh, financial planner professionals David Rudy and Ryan Repco. So we'll see you back in two weeks. Join us for the second and fourth.